Brother, it's good to be with you all tonight. It's always good to uh, see my, uh, my friend Robert and to be with him and uh, so many of you I know and uh, love and appreciate so very much. We got a little feedback going on. Uh, <laughs> do we, can we turn this one off? I don't know. Is it turn off? Okay, okay. Just checking. Well, if I'm sounding okay, I'll try to go on. But uh, uh, let me just say what a pleasure it is to be with you, and it's a real joy to always come to College Hill. Move it down a little. Okay. We'll get us wired up here in a minute. Okay. Well, does that sound a little bit better? Okay. Uh, <clears throat> we uh, at Northwest have uh, really been blessed by the Lord. It's been a good work there. been there for about three years now. Uh, having been at the Birdville congregation here close by for a long time. But it's just good to be in this area and to, to make so many friends and to have uh, the wonderful fellowship that we enjoy here. And you mentioned being able to preach out of the country. Uh, I just got back from the Philippines, and uh, it's a real, uh, a really a great work. That I just wanted to share with you uh, some of the uh, ways the Lord is working around the world. Uh, it's so, uh, uh, such a blessing to go on the other side of the world and uh, see that there are Christians there. We have a fellowship there just like we do here. They're teaching and preaching the same things that we are, and souls are coming to Christ. The Lord is being glorified all over this world. We had uh, 18 baptisms in the short time we were there, and after we left, they said they had five more, and I just got an email from my brother, and he said, well, we've got seven more baptisms now. They've, they've baptized over 115 people, I know, this year. And so they're really working hard and doing a good work, and uh, I just wanted to share that with you because I want you to know that uh, good things are happening in the kingdom of God, and God is uh, truly at work in uh, blessing his servants. And I just want to encourage you tonight uh, to be the light that God wants you to be. We've been singing about that. I appreciate our brother picking out these with the lesson that I thought to bring. I had the title there, uh, th something or what, what the church needs to hear. And I thought, what does the church need to hear? And uh, I found this lesson uh, that I had worked on before, and I thought, this is what I need to bring to us tonight, enabling the glory of the church to shine. And that's what we're going to be working on tonight, enabling the glory of the church to shine. What do people see when they come by this building? What do they see when they come into the worship here, or, or when they contact us uh, out there in the world from day to day. What is it that people see? Do the people see the glory of the church? And what is the glory of the church? The uh, third chapter in verse 20 and 21, there's such a, a wonderful and powerful passage there about the glory of the church. Unto him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or imagine according to the power that works in us, to him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus unto all generations forever and ever. Amen. God is the glory of the church. And that glory is seen in the church by Christ Jesus. I want you to follow with me, if you will, in your Bibles through the book of John for just a moment. I want you to see how that... Jesus shares in the glory of God, and it's through Jesus that God is glorified in the church. In John chapter 1, you remember that very first verse? As John opens up his gospel, he says, In the beginning was the Word, that Word of God, that, that one who expressed God, who made him known. This expression of God, in the beginning was the Word. He was already there, that eternal one. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. This Word, this expression of God, this uh, one that was with God, was in fact God, deity. That was his nature, that was his substance, that was his essence. He was God. And it says in verse 14, you remember, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So that word, that eternal one that was with God, that was God, became flesh. He became one of us. And he in the flesh expressed the glory of the Father. Did you see what it said in verse 18? where it says, No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, who's in the bosom of the Father, He has declared Him. Jesus Christ declares to us the glory of God. 
And then I look over at John, the 14th chapter. And I remember when he was speaking with his disciples and he made this statement to one of them in verse 9. Jesus said to him, Have I been with you so long, and yet you have not known me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. So how can you say, Show us the Father? Jesus says, You've seen me, you've seen the Father. Jesus is the glory of God. He expresses that glory. He shows that glory. He's the express image of his person, according to Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 3. Look over in John 17. Let's go a little further. Look at John 17. In the first few verses here, Jesus is praying to his Father. And he spoke these words. He lifted up his eyes to heaven. He said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that your Son also may glorify you, as you've given him authority over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as, as you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you've sent. I've glorified you on the earth. I've finished the work which you've given me to do. And now, O oh Father, glorify me together with yourself with the glory which I had with you before the world was. Jesus shared in the glory of God. He came to this earth and he showed forth that glory. He declared that glory. And he went back then to heaven after his resurrection. He ascended back into heaven to share in that glory with God once again. But now I want you to notice this how you and I share in that glory as well. Go down to verse 10 of John 17, where Jesus continued his prayer. And he said, And all mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I'm glorified in them. Now I'm no longer in the world, but these are in the world. I come to you, Holy Father. See, Jesus, his glory, the glory of God, is found in us. If you skip down to verse 22 and verse 23, this is what it says. And the glory which you gave me, I've given them, that they may be one just as we are one, I and them and you and me, that they may be perfect in one, and the world may know that you've sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. You see, our purpose, really our purpose in life is, as God's church, as Christians, to bring glory to God. And we do that through Jesus Christ. This is where we find this passage where Paul kind of puts it all together in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 6. And I guess this is really the basis of our lesson here, 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 6. Here it says, For it is the God who commanded light to shine out of darkness, who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. And I know that's a mouthful, but I hope you can follow this with me here. God, you remember, called light out of darkness in the beginning. He said, let there be light, and there was light. He brought light into this dark world. He brought light, and in the same way, he says, he brought light into our hearts. He commanded light to shine out of darkness and has shone in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. He put Jesus in our hearts. That's the light of life. That's the light of salvation. That's the light of truth that shines forth into the world so God can be glorified in the church by Christ Jesus. What did Jesus say about himself in John chapter 8 and verse 12? I am the light of the world. He that follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. And what did he call us, those who follow him? You are the light of the world. Matthew 5, verse 14, verse 16. Even so let your light shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. So I want to ask tonight, seeing that this is our purpose really as God's church to, to shine forth the glory of God through Jesus Christ, how is it that we can enable the church to cause that glory to shine? Enabling the glory of the church to shine. Now we could go a lot of places with this, but I've drawn out three passages of Scripture that I want us to look at tonight from the New Testament that I believe we need to hear that will help us to be the light of the world. 
to show forth the glory of God to each other and to those around us, to all this world that's in darkness. The first of those passages is in the book of Galatians. If you look there with me, let's look at Galatians chapter 6 and verse 14. Galatians chapter 6 and verse 14. The Apostle Paul, as he comes to the end of this letter to the churches of Galatia, he makes a very interesting statement here. He says, but God forbid that I should boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. You know when Paul was crucified to the world? You know when the world was crucified to Paul? He became dead to the world. The world became dead to him. That happened when Paul died in baptism. When he was baptized into Christ Jesus, when he was baptized into his death, when he was buried with Christ by baptism, when he was raised to walk in newness of life, just as he explains it in Romans chapter 6, verse 3 and 4. That old Saul of Tarsus died. That old persecutor of the saints was put to death. That old sinner was buried with Christ. He was given a new life. He became the Apostle Paul, the minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ. He was crucified to this world. That's not what he was living for anymore. And when he writes to the Galatians, he wants them to know, I'll tell you what I boast about. The only thing I'm ever going to brag about, it's going to be the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul would not be bragging about who he is or what he's done or how much he knows. He's bragging about the cross of Jesus Christ. Look with me in Philippians chapter 3, and I want you to see the Apostle Paul had plenty to brag about. If he wanted to brag about something, he could have bragged about a lot of things. In Philippians chapter 3, you notice here, and I will just pick it up in um, uh, verse 4. Though I also might have confidence in the flesh, if anyone else thinks he may have confidence in the flesh, I more so, look, circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, concerning the law, a Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, concerning righteousness which is in the law, blameless, I've got all of these things that I could brag about. But look what he says in verse 7. What things were gained to me, these I've counted lost for Christ. Yet indeed I also count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I've suffered the loss of all things, and count them as rubbish, that I may gain Christ and be found in him. Going on down into verse 11, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death. The glory of the church will shine when we boast in the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. None of us can do anything to merit, to earn our salvation. The Apostle Paul recognized that. And we need to recognize that we are but uh, helpless, hopeless, desperate, uh, lost sinners, but for the grace of God. You know Romans 3.23. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That's every one of us. Romans chapter 5 and verse 6. The Bible tells us while we were without strength, or we were still weak, you see, when we were helpless, when we were hopeless, Christ died for the ungodly. God demonstrated his love toward us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Romans 5 in verse 8. Romans chapter 6 and verse 23. The Bible says that the wages of sin is death. That's what we earn for ourselves. That's what we deserve. That spiritual death, that separation from God that's what we deserve because of our sins. But the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus, our Lord. Paul said in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and verse 9, For by grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourselves, lest anyone should boast, not of works, 
You see, the Apostle Paul was so clear in all of these passages to let us know that our boasting must be in the cross of Jesus Christ. And I'm afraid that sometimes we get to thinking that we have earned it, that we do deserve it, because we're better than others, because we have been baptized, because we have gone to church three times a week, or we've taken the Lord's Supper every week, or we've given 10% of our means, or, or because we've done so many good works. Do you remember uh, what uh, Jesus taught in that parable in Luke chapter 18 about the Pharisee and the publican? I know it's probably familiar to a lot of you, but I think we need to read it again. Luke chapter 18, beginning in verse 9. And, and see if we at all see ourselves in any of this. In verse 9 it says, Also he spoke this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank you, I'm not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I possess. And the tax collector, standing afar off, would not so much as raise his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Does this parable convict any of us? Do we see ourselves in this picture? Have we been hypercritical or judgmental? Have we thought ourselves better than others to look down our nose at others? Have we been guilty of the very things this Pharisee was guilty of? Or do we find ourselves with the attitude of the sinner who cried out for the mercy of God in penitence, recognizing his weakness, recognizing that he fell short? I remember Jesus' warning in Matthew 23, 13, when he said, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. You shut up the kingdom of God against men. You don't go in, and neither do you allow those who are entering to go in. Have we hindered others from coming to Christ, from entering into his kingdom? Because we've been boasting in ourselves, in what we've done, in what we know, in who we are, instead of in the cross of Jesus Christ. I wonder what is our attitude about the prostitute, the drunkard, the drug addict, the homosexual, the liar, the thief. I found a little poem I thought kind of helped bring some perspective to this. It's called Return the Cross to Golgotha. I don't know who wrote it. I simply argue that the cross be raised again at the center of the marketplace as well as on the steeple of the church. I'm recovering the claim that Jesus was not crucified in a cathedral between two candles, but on a cross between two thieves, on a town garbage heap, at a crossroad of politics so cosmopolitan that they had to write his title in Hebrew and in Latin and in Greek, and at the kind of place where cynics talk smut and thieves curse and soldiers gamble because that's where he died and that's what he died about 
And that's where Christ's men ought to be and what church people ought to be about. Enabling the glory of the church to shine, we must boast in the cross of Christ and no one and nothing else. Let me bring something else to our attention today. Take a look with me, if you will, in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 1 and 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 1 and 2. Paul talks about his coming to the city of Corinth with the gospel of Christ. Here's what he says. And I, brethren, when I came to you, did not come with excellence of speech or of wisdom, declaring to you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Paul had one message. Jesus Christ and Him crucified. You know, the Jews, they had the law. They took great pride in the law. But there was no salvation in the law. As the Hebrew writer points out in chapter 10, the blood of bulls and goats could not take away sins. Salvation had to come of the promise of the one who was coming, of the Savior. That's where salvation was found. The Greeks, they had their philosophies, their wisdom, their knowledge. But folks, all of the knowledge and the wisdom of this world does not have the power to save us from even one sin. Only Jesus Christ and Him crucified. That's why Paul said in Romans 1, 16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel. For it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. There's just one message. There's only one message that can save our soul. Jesus himself, when he was on this earth, made the claim, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes unto the Father but by me. You remember how the Apostle, pa <clears throat> excuse me, the Apostle Peter put it in Acts chapter 4 and verse 12? How there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. The message of Jesus Christ, that was the message that caused those in Acts chapter 2 verse 37 to cry out, what shall we do? They had heard about Jesus, about his death, about his burial, about his resurrection. They wanted to know, what do we do? That same message in Acts the 8th chapter. You remember when the Ethiopian was going in his chariot reading from Isaiah and God brought Philip the preacher to him and what did he do? He began to preach unto him, Jesus. And preaching unto him, Jesus, he was wanting to know, what hinders me from being baptized? That same message was what Paul brought to the city of Corinth and caused many of the Corinthians to hear, to believe, to be baptized, according to Acts chapter 18 and verse 8. And that same message is what will cause men and women and boys and girls to come to Christ today. That same message. A couple of years ago, I had a gospel meeting in uh, Kuntz, Texas. Anybody know where Kuntz, Texas is? Well, it's just uh, a little place, kind of southeast, and uh, close to the Gulf area. But uh, I was doing a meeting there, and there was a family. They had a teenage daughter. The dad was picking her up from school every day, and you know, as we were preaching through that uh, meeting, she began to ask her dad questions. Her dad began to talk to her. And every day after school when he would pick her up, they would talk the Bible and talk about the Lord. Before that gospel meeting was over, her father baptized her into Jesus Christ. It was a tremendous, uh, it was a tr a tremendous joy for that whole congregation because everybody knew this family so well. 
And, and I've said that to say that what are we telling our, our teenagers who haven't yet obeyed the gospel? Uh, what, what, are we, what are we telling our, our neighbors who don't know the Lord? What about the, that unbelieving spouse that's sitting by us on the couch? What are we saying? When God opens doors to, to our family and to our friends and, and to co-workers and, and uh, schoolmates and, and others, when God opens those doors, what do we say? What are we telling them? There's only one message. There's only one thing that can set them free from sin. There's only one thing that can change their life. There's only one answer, and that's Jesus Christ and Him crucified. We've got to preach it. Not only must we boast in the cross of Christ, but we must preach that cross. Because we can sit here in our church buildings year after year after year, and people can pass by, and they'll end up lost if we don't preach it. If we don't get that message somehow, somewhat, into their hearts, into their minds. There's a final thing I want us to think about tonight. It comes from the words of Jesus in Luke chapter 9, verse 23. Luke chapter 9, in verse 23. Listen to what he says. He said to them all, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. I think what Jesus is telling us is we need to put up or shut up. <laughs> talk alone is pretty cheap. <laughs> we need to practice what we preach. If anybody's going to care about what we say, we have to see that we're real, that we're genuine about all of this. We've got to, every day, everywhere, carry the cross. What does that mean? Well, Jesus said, deny self. Deny self. That's what Jesus did when he left the glories of heaven, gave up the privileges and the prerogatives and the position of deity to come to this earth as a man, born of a virgin by the power of the Holy Spirit, the Son of God, the Son of Mary, to, to grow up and to, to be tempted and tried just like we are, to suffer the death of the cross. It had nothing to do with him. It was all about us. As he walked on this earth, it wasn't about him. It was about us. He forgave us. He loved us. He taught us. He helped us. He served us. We see that compassion of Christ everywhere he goes. For others, not for himself. You remember what he taught his apostles in Matthew 20 and verse 28? For the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister to give his life a ransom for many. That's who Jesus is. That's what it means to deny self. It's, it's pictured at the last Passover when Jesus was gathered there with his apostles. And you remember, nobody had washed their feet. And nobody was going to get up and wash anybody else's feet. <laughs> but Jesus did. Their Lord, their Savior, their Master did. He began to wash their feet. They didn't understand what in the world he was doing. But he told them, I'm giving you an example, that you should wash one another's feet. What was he talking about? Humility. What was he talking about? Service. What was he talking about? Deny self. That's how the glory of the church is going to shine through us. When we deny self, when we serve one another the way Christ has served us. Take up your cross daily, Jesus said, and follow me. 
That's what he did. He was ready, he was willing to sacrifice whatever to do the Father's will. Nothing was going to deter him. Nothing was going to distract him. Nothing was going to keep him from doing what God wanted him to do. In the face of rejection and betrayal and suffering and death, Jesus could say, finally, it's finished. I've done the Father's will. I've completed the work that he gave me to do. What an example, brethren, he gives to us today. Peter put it like this in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 21 to 24, how that Christ suffered for us, leaving us an example that we should follow in his steps. Who did no sin, neither was any guile found in his mouth, who when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he threatened, threatened not, but committed himself to him that judges righteously, who himself bore our sins in his own body upon the tree, and by whose stripes we are healed. That's what Jesus taught us. How to deny ourselves. How to take up our cross every day. Are we real, genuine, true disciples of Jesus Christ? Because hypocrites will hinder the glory of the church from shining in this world of darkness. But when we carry the cross everywhere, every day, you can't help but to see the glory of the Christ, the glory of the cross, the glory of the church shine through us. Any of you ever been to uh, Carlsbad Caverns? You ever been way down deep in the caverns where they'll take you and there's no light anywhere? I mean... You can't see anything. It's pitch black. In fact, it's so dark in there that you can feel the darkness. I mean, it's thick. One little girl was crying, and she was afraid because it was so dark. And her brother said to her, Don't worry. Don't cry. Somebody knows how to turn the lights on. And I'm telling you tonight, and somebody knows how to turn the lights on in our world of darkness, in our world of sin and sorrow and heartache and, and suffering and misery and separation and confusion and, and all of this uh, evil that we live around us. We, the darkness seems some, sometimes so overwhelming. We need to know that someone knows how to turn the light on. That same one who called light out of darkness in the beginning. That same one who has turned the lights on in our hearts, bringing Jesus Christ into our hearts, bringing into our hearts the salvation and the truth and the life that only Jesus can give. I'm telling you tonight, if you're not a Christian, you can have that. If you're overwhelmed with darkness, he wants to bring light to your heart. You don't ask Jesus into your heart. No, that's not what the Bible teaches. You give your heart to Jesus. You trust Him with your life. And you do that when you make that decision in your heart to turn away from sin, to live for God. And you declare that faith before others and you then give yourself to Him in the waters of baptism. You die with Him. You die to this world. And He'll recreate you. He'll make you brand new. You will, as another figure in the Bible calls it, you will be born again. You can be God's child tonight. You can know Jesus as your Savior, as your Lord. You can have the light that will lead you all the way home. Some of you, maybe you've left that light. But you know how to get back. You know the way back home. When we sing this song of invitation tonight, Hope that if anyone needs to come, they will. Right now, while together we stand, as we sing.